Um, as, as these presentations that came before me pointed out, in the last decade or so we've seen an increasing contraction of the industry um, as a result of uh, increased focus on sustainability and profitability that's been, been eroded in the industry. Um, and fishermen are amongst the first to agree that while some of those measures have been very difficult to adapt to, they've actually been quite positive in the outcomes in terms of catch rates and value. However, looking at the demographics of the commercial fishing industry and the public perceptions and opinions of sustainability, as Tony's alluded to, uh, alluded to pointed out, um, I'm suggesting that it's reasonable to have serious concerns for the future of the Australian commercial fishing industry and to ask the question of who is actually in control and who's making decision about if or not we want to have a future, an industry future. And as the presentations this morning pointed out, it's actually an issue that needs the concern of all Australians because the, Australian, the commercial fishing industry is quite central to food production, or not central to, but is an important component of our food production, uh, source of protein, export income, alibi small. And aside from this, the industry has contributed to the diversity of our food industry and the Australian culture, even way before white settlement. And it's therefore one that I don't believe, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room doesn't believe should actually slip, slip away without serious regard. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about the fact that I believe that no one is currently consciously in control of the long-term future of our fishing industry. The industry itself doesn't actually have the capacity to take control of that future. And that what we need is a top-down approach from industry and government together that commands community attention and to address explicitly what the future of our Australian commercial fishing industry is going to be. But let me take a few te steps backwards and uh, cover off how I'm going to fill in why I'm coming to those conclusions. I want to break down the question um, into several parts. The, parts. the first is an examination of the demographics of the industry um, to reveal it is actually extremely vulnerable at this point in time to external pressures. Then have a look at what those external pressures are. And most importantly, public perceptions of the industry and the drivers of those and then look at the resilience of the industry. And the question of it is why, why hasn't the industry engaged with those pressures, like some of the other industries have, other primary industries have, um, in terms of the Australian community and fostering support to secure the industry's future. Lastly, I want to discuss the current lack of conscious control over the future of our fisheries, and if those most likely to be controlling it are in fact the groups who want to be in control and the choices that may come with that examination. So overall, looking at the industry demographics, basically they're not a picture that is painted of a vibrant emerging industry, unfortunately, we'd like it to be, but the reality is that on average those in the fishing industry are in their mid-40s, uh, 2007 study of the marine scale fishery in South Australia, 48 years was the average age, which was 10 years older than the South Australian population. Um, varies from fishery to fishery, but basically you're looking at married or de facto with dependents. Highest level of education is fourth form of high school. And they're not a large percentage of our working population. Looking at that employment side of things, the ABS census in 2006 identified 6,397 people employed directly in the commercial fishing industry. And that was in wild catch, wild catch aquaculture and post-harvest sectors. Just 0.06% of the Australian working population. However, there's probably an a lot of you in here realise many of the people in the industry are casually employed, so may not have been included in that census at that time, because the census happens on one night, one particular night in the year, and if you didn't happen to be employed in the industry at that time, you didn't get counted. Um, many are self-employed, 
they may put themselves down as business owners, which under the census classification system may have meant they were misclassified and not actually included in the industry. And also too, a lot of these businesses are family businesses. So there's a lot of people working in this industry who don't actually even get counted because they're not paid, not technically classified as employed. So it might be reasonable to suggest that you know, there's at least double that amount. Unfortunately, that still means that it's not a huge industry in the big scheme of the total Australian workforce. So overall, what we've got from that is an ageing population with a and what, oh, sorry, the other thing that I've got here that I want to point out was that this, this, uh, this is from some work I recently did with Rurdick. We can see population, total commercial fishing. While we've increased since 2006, we're still lower than we were in 2001. Unfortunately, that's not new entrants coming in. It is aquaculture, the growth of aquaculture. But it does also to anecdotally saying that it's quite a number of people who got out in 2006 who are starting to come back by back into the industry. So it's, it's the exact details of that. But the, the, the takeaway from that is that we've got less in the industry now than we had in 2001. And that's largely as a result of a lot of external pressures. We've got people in the industry, they're getting older, there's less of them, they haven't got a lot of education necessarily, and I'm making generalisations here, to engage with a changing environment and adapt quickly and, and, and keep adapting as things keep changing very quickly. So they're a community that is generally vulnerable to external pressures. So aside from those demographic challenges, we've also got these other challenges coming from a variety of sources, which aside from the ongoing march of development, the, and, and people who see fishing as perhaps not congruent with the, a sustainable future for Australia, there's a number of others. The top of that list, as we've pointed out before, was access operating costs, productivity and profitability. It's the most obvious one. It's rising fuel prices, which is something that's very difficult to, to arrest. Um, despite that, many operators have become more efficient in their businesses and they've found other ways of addressing it. They have, they have really engaged with these issues. Profitability is an ongoing challenge due to decreased F access and effort increased effort caps, sorry, decreased effort caps, which result from the pressures outside the business. Those including coastal development, marine parks, marine protected areas, notably public's increasing environmentally and environmental and sustainability concerns, changes to environmental flows that affect fish, fish spawning habitats and coastal nursery grounds, and climate variability as we've recently seen very dramatically in the last few months and has been extensively discussed this morning. All of these issues are important and they all need our attention and we'll continue to challenge our interaction with the environment, not just in oceans and waterways. However, in some quarters, the response in regard to fish stocks, and again, reverting to the, some of the information discussed in the previous two presentations, is to restrict fishing completely or, or largely. And often the data that's used to justify that is not appropriate to the Australian situation. The real state of Australia's fisheries, is, as was pointed out again earlier, thank you guys for setting the scene, is that it's largely unknown in the general Australian population. And that we are on, in now in the top four in the world in terms of how we're managing our, our fisheries. The result of all that is constant and increasing, increasing pressure on governments and management agencies to de decrease the amount of area available to fishers and increase operating restrictions in those areas that are available. The problem is there's little open and transparent public discussion of the competing nature of our resource use and how we might mediate those to create an environmentally sustainable future. 
Focus is needed on how to engage with the broader community to manage an equitable future for the industry. However, on that basis, uh, people say, but you know, farmers are resilient. It's time for fishermen to be resilient. You know, that's what they do when they get tough. Isn't that what they should be drawing on now? Fishermen do see themselves as extremely resilient. They have the ability to keep on doing what they've been doing despite knocks and challenges and changes in circumstance. Resilience amongst fishers has and is displaying itself in doing a num number of things, smarter, more efficiently, and getting greater value for less volume of product. They've been doing that extremely well. However, sometimes it seems resilience is expected to be an endless resource, and this was touched upon in one of the presentations this morning, that fishermen or any other producer, whether it be farmers, fishermen, whoever, can draw upon to develop in the face of any or constant changes in their environment. We need to recognise that resilience is the flip side of a very thin coin, and the other side of that coin is vulnerability. The resource an individual or an industry is reliant upon for livelihoods and production is constantly increasingly restricted. At some point, they cease to be able to do what they do. They have to move on to doing other things, as have a large number of fishers already as a result of restructures that have been undertaken since the 1990s, and quite rightly in, in pursuit of sustainability. In addition to this, as, already, as I've already outlined, it's an ageing industry with relatively few new entrants. At some point, resilience is not going to be enough to prevent the industry from disappearing as a viable primary industry in Australia. And it's at this point, I believe, we're likely to be facing that in the future, a future potentially without commercial fishing.